the next segment that i'm very bullish on is deep in decentralized physical infra i'm mm-hmm. building that myself at fleek and i can already see that it's having its own impact where people are now starting to accept fleek as a solution and moving sort of away from versal because they were able to see the benefits of perpetual storage Hello everyone and welcome to the 19th episode of uh, Colors of Web3 and Entrepreneurship. Uh, my name is Lum, your typical Web3 host. Here I am today back in the Web3 world and I'm sitting here with uh, Kanish Kurana who is the head of uh, developer relation at uh, Flick. Um, Kanish, can you give us a quick introduction uh, about yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here, Lam. I think it's a big pleasure and honor for me to be here with you. Discuss about things that you know I've been working and building on. So, hey everyone, my name is Kanish. I'm the head of developer relations at Fleek. I love building softwares. I love building communities. And in general, it's my passion to help developers build softwares that can scale better and also build communities that can help more people beyond that. That's sort of what I do. That's sort of what I focus on. At Fleek, I'm trying to build a developer community based around almost every developer category you can think of, which means people who are very new to development, we are there for them. People who are sort of intermediate, they've been working professionally for some time, we are here for them. And finally, you know, people who then want to become startup founders, we are there for them as well. So that's sort of what my focus is and what I'm working on. And that's a quick intro about me and what I do. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure we will talk more about that uh, about that later. But uh, before we go into that, actually, I'd like to know a bit about your background. Uh, please feel free to share with us whatever timeline you feel is appropriate, maybe from university, since your first job or whenever, you know, tell us, tell us about your professional background, uh, your upbringing also. Absolutely. So I think my passion for coding in general started in school itself. This is like sixth grade when I learned something called QBasic. And uh, I was always a computer geek. I would, you know, love messing around with computers. My parents remind me that when I was a kid, I wanted to make games. That is a dream log gone very far away from me. I make websites now. That's a much more easier thing to do than make games. But yeah, more or less, um, it started in sixth grade, learned something called QBasic. By the time I came to class 11, I was able to make full stack applications uh, using Java. So I used to use Android Studio back then to actually make the entire application, make a layer of backend on it using Spring Boot and all. And uh, then, yeah, university started, learned Python, web development, etc, etc. And Towards my end of university, I sort of got into blockchain. A friend of mine took me to an event and he's like, hey, listen, there's this very cool thing called blockchain. You will not need a bank if you have a good blockchain associated with you. I was like, wait, that is very interesting. So yeah, then we just moved forward and I became like hardcore Solidity enthusiast, started building things here and there with Solidity. And here we are today. (laughs) So that's a quick intro to where I started and now where I am. I know. So I don't think many of us realize that, but yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, how, how did you first learn about the, the crypto Web3 space in general? Like what, what was it? Who, who taught you? Who brought you into it? Or maybe like <laughs> how, how did you come across it, right? First, yeah. Absolutely. I think this was when pandemic in India had just started. And um, me, my, my dad was actually big on NFTs. So he was hmm. like, hey, listen, somebody sold a monkey for 2 million. Like, what monkey for two million? <laughs> Must be a golden <laughs> monkey. He's like, no, it's a photo. Look, it's a funny monkey. I'm like, wait, what? So that's when I started exploring. So I made my first MetaMask account. It has been hacked. It has, that MetaMask is long gone. Oh. Um, made my first account on OpenSea. Saw what Polygon is for the first time. Nice. Saw what, saw there's somebody named Vitalik. So I yeah. had some idea about Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is something I was very, very familiar with. Mm. I also attempted running a node and all, but I never had any idea that it can ever go beyond Bitcoin, which is what Ethereum did, you know, general purpose blockchain application for everybody. You know, I was, so my parents are doctors. We were still helping. I was helping my parents out during the pandemic. And suddenly I came back to my system one day. I just sit and I'm like, wait, what monkeys are being sold? What is Polygon? What is Ethereum? Now I have to study everything. And um, then a friend of mine actually introduced me to a couple of people hosting events around in India, online events, offline events, both of them. During pandemic online, after pandemic offline. This is in 2020, right? Yeah. So hmm. 2020, then 20, and then 2022. So online events had started way back in 2019, 2020. 
but hmm. offline events uh, i actually started going in 2022 so that was almost 2 years ago and this was not just web3 events this was also events uh, by companies like mongodb you know a uh, big database provider across the world um so i learned a lot on how communities are built but i also learned a lot on how web3 is built and i realized that after every event i i would come home and just make notes and start studying online uh, we didn't have chat gpt in 2020 so yeah. it was a lot of research but now it's very easy to do all of that's a little bit of something i see so i i guess was it would, would it be fair to say is that your dad was actually the one introduced <laughs> you to web3 in a way with the monkey <laughs> like, i <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming he's probably referred to the Boy Ape, right? Boy Ape Yacht Club, right? Yeah, the famous yeah, collection. Exactly. That. Okay. Exactly. I see. That. Awesome. And then, um, can you tell us what what do you do for fun outside of work? What are your hobbies? Absolutely. I I love driving. I would uh, you know put on some good music. Uh, music. My dad has a very good car, and I usually drive that whenever I find time. Uh, apart from that, um, I love working out a little bit here and there whenever I find time and. that's majorly all i do for fun <laughs> that's it nice driving so have you drove i mean india is quite a big country actually when i in my two times that i've been there i've just realized that i mean india is actually very big country right i mean it yeah. just seems it seems small because it's crowded but like, have you done any cross country driving in india so i've driven a lot around north of india i've gone from delhi to punjab i've gone from delhi to up and uh, that's that's like a drive of 200 kilometers when you go to punjab it's like 600 kilometers not 600 but yeah, around 450 kilometers at least if you go to the farther end of punjab that is 600 for sure so i've done all of that and um, it's my favorite thing to just put on music and drive at a comfortable speed and just enjoy the drive while you go and yeah that's something i enjoy a lot i, re- I realized nice that's awesome what type of music do you listen to then when you're driving i'm a big post malone fan hip hop all the way I want to listen to good like upbeat music but I used to play guitar when I was a kid so from time to time I go back to rock music as well and that's majorly um, the kind of music I switch between so it's hip hop and rock nice awesome awesome wow you have very uh, diverse interests and for your <laughs> thinking <laughs> impressive so do do you, you, you see play guitar this day or no no it's been no? 3 oh. years <laughs> that guitar is just kept in the corner of my room I'm very ashamed when I look at it and um, yeah i hope i go back there someday but yeah now is just not the time i have oh, too good. much to build yeah that no i bet it's global um you were running it like a hack house right if i remember correctly right? that time, yeah. yeah yeah so that you is. actually haven't even started building your project yet and this is like already at i think it was like so the hackathon began on like friday evening and this i went i think i ran into you on like saturday 11 pm at night right and then the project was due at like 9 am on sunday morning you haven't even done anything yet <laughs> you just came in you ate some food and i was just talking asking questions and uh, i know you haven't even wrote a code but you actually even spend like 45 minutes or i think over an hour like just talking to me and trying to help my team with our our problem at that time so i i really um, appreciate that and basically that's how i met uh, a yeah That was a very fun day because uh, mm. I remember um, we were just talking about land chain, how to implement, yeah. you know, calls to land chain, get answers from AI. And I was just like, hey, wait, I made this before, and I showed you the, uh, you know, a project that I had worked on so, a couple months ago. So yeah, um, fun times, dude. I think that was a very very good hackathon in general. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and I, I'm actually I was really impressed also with the 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 mobile app project that you had built before. For one of your clients, yeah, that was really impressive. Like you did everything by yourself, <laughs> front end, back end, and even the AI also. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Anyway, so yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, deep dive into your current company, uh, Flick. Yeah, feel free to share any um, absolutely website or anything that you have already prepared. Absolutely. Um, to get started, I would like to give an intro. Then I have sure. a cool little demo for what deployments on Flick can look like, and then you know. talking about the road map what we have in the future etc so um click is a decentralized deployment platform and that is what we've started as for the longest time now we help you put your files on ipfs we help you put your websites on the blockchain we can help you put your data anywhere on any of these infra providers and um, one of the coolest things that we do is now that we have started working on and uh, the test net of this is also going to be out uh, within a week It's called the Fleek Network. So it's not just a deployment platform now. It's more over a decentralized infrastructure that helps you put your, you know, data on chain 
and make it available to you through something called edge networks. So edge is a concept that has existed in cloud computing for a very long time. You know, edge computing is when you don't do computation on nodes, rather you serve data through edge decentralized pipelines. So you don't really have to wait for your server sitting in US Central One uh, on Amazon to deliver your data to you. You can actually do it through the edge that's serving two nodes. And that's sort of what we've been building at in uh, at Fleek. And the idea here is that when I say it is edge computation, one cool feature we have is geolocation. So the edge that is closest to your geolocation is going to be serving you data instead of a server sitting miles away in US while you are sitting in India. At least that's the case for me. So that's what we've been working on. We've had two very successful testnet phases of the Fleek network and we are releasing the Fleek network testnet phase three in a week. So we will have more performance uh, information. We will be very, very close to releasing close to releasing the mainnet as well. And that is something I'm personally very excited about because I've generally felt that data knowledge and access should be as decentralized and as close to you as possible. And with the kind of tech that we've got brewing in house, I think websites can load a lot faster. Servers can compute data a lot faster and you can just provide information in a way that centralized servers just can't provide and with every contributor into the community that just becomes another node so that brings okay. more power to the fleet network more computation to the fleet network and it's better for everybody using the fleet platform so that's what fleet is and that's what we've been working on. nice so um, are you, is it safe to say that flick has already expanded a lot of services and i think i mean first time um, i think i heard about flick is from the ipfs right hosting was that the first use case right but now it has already expanded yeah. like you said like with so exactly. much more, right? Hmm. So um, one of the most initial things we did was, um, of course, IPFS hosting, right? Bringing data on IPFS, providing a way to compute that data, put it through a gateway that you can access on a browser. But uh, definitely now we've gone sort of beyond that. We were able to notice shortcomings of all the networks that we were sort of relying on. And therefore we felt that, hey, I think edge computation is something that is also geolocation based is much much hmm. better than relying on a node that is miles miles far away from you even in a decentralized infrastructure so i am uh, say using ipfs but my ipfs node that i'm talking to is sitting somewhere in uk which is so so far away and um, to solve that problem basically we started building this layer out we want it to be very modular we've got a couple cool integrations happening with zk and um, yeah, that's what we have, what I can share so far about, uh, you know, who we were, just a decentralized deployment platform to a decentralized infrastructure that we are now becoming and people can sort of build on top of us. Um, don't get me wrong, the website deployment is still one of the first use cases of Fleek Network, but we are excited to see what people come up with. And my job is to support people building more and more on the Fleek Network. So yeah, that's a cool or like an elaborate introduction to everything. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So then for the edge network, who who will run these network? I guess that'll be one of my first questions. It was this all be run by it's people. people. It's a okay. community so, infrastructure. So it's fully decentralized. A, exactly. Hmm. You have a, a good enough machine that will be able to run the network without any problems. Hmm. Okay. Is it well, there was another company I remember the um brand themselves, the one that you can run with very simple, very low uh what is it? Low even with very cheap software, right? Maybe you can run, or maybe, maybe not, not even a Raspberry Pi, but maybe something. Yeah. I, I can't remember the name of that company, but like, is, is your company with Edge, like what type of hardware is required? Do we need a like fancy gaming laptop, gaming PC? Not really. From the first two phases of the testnet, we were able to realize that while you can't run it on like a 4GB RAM laptop, but you can't basically run anything on a 4GB RAM laptop. But yeah, you need somewhere around 16 to 32 GBs of RAM to be able mm. to run it successfully. We are making, uh, we are doing some tests internally to see what kind of other chipsets can we work with, um, what kind of other configurations like SGX can be fit into the architecture and make it work. But um, that's still in experimental stages. I would say that if you have a good enough, for example, if you have a MacBook, you should have minimal problems running it. And if you do have any problems, I'm there to help you. We'll probably mm. run it together. And I'll be working on a lot of guides for different kind of configurations that you can set in to make the network. Work. Hmm. Interesting. So then is, is the idea is kind of similar to you guys want to become like the AWS in a way for Web3? 
exactly yeah. fair to say okay exactly yeah so mm-hmm. it needs to become very you you've actually placed it very nicely because aws is centralized infrastructure layer for everything mm-hmm. we want to become the decentralized infrastructure layer for everything um shortcomings you know there are shortcomings to a centralized architecture with control authority etc with us yeah. all of that just goes away out of the picture and majorly that's sort of what we want to become uh we've already targeted the front end layer of that uh, you know aws has amplify we have fleet platform so just come to fleet.xyz mm. host whatever website you want to host and move forward um i can present that in a bit as well um because the platform is sure. working phenomenally and um, yeah the network needs another week for people to actually see and run their test nets and everything that they've got brewing so that's the case there oh that's great can you uh, share with us a, a, maybe a simple demo of the flick um, site and you know what what people can do over there absolutely absolutely i'd be more than happy to do that let me quickly present my screen so here is the flick website i hope it's visible yes it's visible yeah i'm awesome. seeing no oh, very beautiful so, website <laughs> hello <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, I love it personally as well. And uh, you know, Flick helps you build lightning fast web three apps, and it's got like a bunch of things in store where you can, you know, compute and all. You can have your own domains integrated. You can have uh, the entire IPFS storage module inside this particular platform only. And that's one thing that I want to, you know, walk everybody through. So right now, the platform is in the alpha stage, but we are more than happy to grant access to any developer who wants to come on board. or any founder who wants to just try out the website or just any enthusiast who found fleek interesting and they want to you know get on fleek so with that said we've got some really interesting features uh the first one is i'd like to start from the bottom right here which is storing your files because i feel that adding your files to ipfs rv even filecoin is what we can provide right now and you need to understand that this particular storage is perpetual storage which means that unlike g drive or amazon s3 when you delete a file it's just gone things cannot be delete, uh, deleted from the blockchain and that is what the benefit we are sort of leveraging here so i can go to store your files and then i can go to upload and you know during upload i can just upload whatever i like so i upload a random gif that i have of the you know thunder that we sort of carry and now when i click on this particular thunder this is what we have <laughs> so this particular image uh or rather this particular gift lives on ipfs it is perpetually stored and if you see here is the link for it this is the ipfs hash that we've sort of gone through the gateway and now you can access it through this link and this is true for all the files that you upload here not just this one so i can dive into a little bit of fundamentals so when a file goes to ipfs for a normal browser to see it you need something called a gateway and that is what we sort of help people with to give them a gateway and connect them to the blockchain for their files and yeah that's majorly how we store and help people deploy files now uh, on to some more interesting stuff which is sites so you can definitely add your own site i haven't added one yet and if you are sort of trying fleek out and you want to see how templates work or how you know templates on astro which is another framework or hugo work you can try them out uh we have friends at lens protocol who sort of contributed um a starter kit for us and we can deploy almost any one of them we've got a bunch of templates in store and uh, using them you can quickly go through the cycle of deploying applications and working through them i think one of the simplest things that a developer wants in 2024 is nextjs it's a full stack framework you can make your backend and frontend in the same thing and it's especially the most beneficial during hackathons because you have a distributed team your back end and front end developers need to run their servers and then they can connect the application that is just so much overhead so just deploying next js is the easiest way to move forward and we've got a template ready for anybody who wants to deploy and we've got documentation for it everything that you will need to make next js work with fleek and it will help you build a static site and with the fleek network coming on board very very soon you will be able to build a full stack site using fleek as well if i just click on deploy template the platform moves forward i can sort of you know connect my github to the platform and now it will sort of redirect me i uh, install my app on my own github let's quickly go through that flow so i'll configure this i'll give it you know whatever repositories i wanted to have access to let me see i had uploaded a 
quick repository right before this one. Actually, let's just do all repositories for now and we can just move forward. So the benefit with all repositories is that you don't have to individually select, right? And that's a quick way to move forward. Now I come back here. Um, my account has been selected. Repository name is Next.js template. It will be a private Git repository for now. And you just click on create and deploy template. That is it. You get the code, you get the website, you can do whatever you like to it. And that's it. We solve all the problems that developers have in setting up their website for deployments. And I personally felt that this is such a good way to start a project because I get Next.js and it is already deployed. So now when I'm working and if anything crashes on the deploy template, I can just roll back. And that makes awesome. my flow very, very easy. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. So we also get a cute little deployed link with onfleek.app domain. You can obviously nice. go and edit the domain if you like. And all the details about this particular application will be provided. So, so one question I have of, about this is, yeah. is the website actually being hosted on IPFS? So it, the way it oh. works is that yeah. um, the website's files, they live on IPFS. But hmm. now IPFS itself cannot compute data. It can just store data. And that is where sort of fleet servers come into the picture. So with the help of whatever compute functionalities the network will build, whatever servers we have deployed right now, and whatever infra we have in store for you, we pick those files from IPFS, we build them, and then they go and you can use them or see them through the browser that you're using. And that is the kind of infra that we're trying to do. Now, right now, these are just static, which means you cannot do server-side rendering, you cannot do anything like that. But in a week from now, you will be able to do that as well. And we have a really, really interesting fleet network, serverless proof of concept that we'll be releasing. So if you're watching this podcast um, now, you should be able to see that in a week. And if you're watching it anywhere in February, that POC is already out and you will be able to access it. That's awesome. Oh. awesome. It looks like it's, it's yeah. building. So, Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. It probably take, take a couple of minutes, right? Yeah. Correct. Probably yeah. 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 So, you yeah. know, next JS, it downloads all the dependencies. It goes through everything and you're done. So build breakdown is also going on right here. You can see all the logs, no details yet there. And finally, any domains that you want to connect, you can do that as well. So right now it's just going through its own process, going through its, you can also, by the way, track your deploys that you've done. If any yeah. audits have been conducted, you can check them here. Analytics will also soon be available. And in settings, you can change the, you know, the domain on fleek domain that you have, or you can connect, you know, your own domains as well, which is a functionality right here on custom domains. Um, and we also provide ENS domains. So my domain is oh. Eth. You can just go and show hmm. ETH on like Google enter, and then you can see my website. So, you know, that's another feature we provide. And that's yeah, really that's cool. By the way, will the, will the ENS domain be able to resolve on a regular browser like Google Chrome or Firefox? People can okay. actually see. <laughs> you would, oh, you no? would okay. need a blockchain, <laughs> yeah, blockchain card browser for that. But again, hmm. uh, we are planning to solve that very, very soon. So you should be able to see some functionality built out around that in a couple of weeks, if not months. Hmm. So yeah, there you go. The fleet network Next.js template is ready. Oh, nice. It is deployed. And yeah, you can go through the fleet documentation, uh, which is, again, something I absolutely love because we have an SDK that you can use. So you don't even have to come to the platform to hmm. put your files on IPFS. Or if you are like me and you don't want to just turn on Google Chrome as well to do any of that, we have a CLI as well. So you can deploy applications, you can put files on IPFS, you can do all the compute functionalities through your like terminal of your computer. That's it. And you know, that's basically the entire functionality suite that we have at Fleet. And we are obviously building more and more features as and when developers come back to us, we always work with them and try to find the easiest and the fastest resolution to their problems. And for that, we have our own Discord server. So you can join the Discord server, share any details, come here, say hi, and um, you know, just work with us throughout uh, building this and nice. building this as a very scalable decentralized layer. And yeah, hmm. that's majorly all I had to present. Awesome! Well, thank you. That's very uh, interesting uh, demo that you show us over there. Yeah, so it's very easy. It's kind of remind me a lot of the Vercel, maybe some other deployment in in Web exactly. right? But except here, I guess you pinning the file. I guess the main difference. And please, please correct me if I'm wrong here. So in regular like 
I guess versus how they just put it on I don't know some centralized servers, right? Yeah. I'm assuming. And then, in, but in your case, in Flick, the files are actually stored in IPFS, and then but they, so you it. still have a like a Web two domain address, so people can actually still go there and visit it on regular browser. Exactly. So um, hmm. just to add on there, I think you've explained it very nicely that while Vercel is built on top of AWS, we want people to be able to build more Vercels on top of Fleet Network, right? So the hmm. larger vision is to obviously have IPFS there. We respect and love what IPFS has given to the world. But with Fleet Network, with having decentralized edge compute, and you know whatever geolocation functionalities we'll discuss a couple seconds ago, um, all of that just makes the website or the app experience so much better. Because now you don't have to wait for servers to respond. You have your like you can run your own node on your laptop, and that can simply be your own you know server or your own you know um, like what Amazon has EC2 VMs is what they provide. Yeah. So you know you can do all of that by contributing to the network. You will obviously be rewarded in tokens. There is going to be an entire incentivization there built on top of it. So every contributor, be it somebody who deploys a website, somebody who builds with us, or somebody who just runs the Fleek node, all of them are very dear and close to our heart, and we will incentivize all of them as best as we can. Nice. So uh, how, how many people are actually running the Fleek nodes right now? Absolutely. So um, we've had a lot of interest around the first and second testnet phases. And now we will be releasing uh, the phase three of the testnet. So phase three is when we sort of uh, test things out on our end. So when we run the Fleet Foundation runs the nodes themselves just to ensure everything works. And phase three B is when community starts running their nodes. And that is when you will actually start seeing the power of edge compute come to life because we want people from distant parts of the world to come together and run these nodes together. So three B, I'm very excited about the phase three B. And that is when people will be able to run nodes together. Exciting, yeah. So I guess people, um, I'm, I'm still a bit curious. So do people run this on their spare laptop or do they have like dedicated server? Do they buy online server and then the users run the node or what? How, how, how um, do you envision them had, using it? We've had a variety of interest around this and people have asked the same question to me a bunch of times. Like how should I provision my machine to work with Fleek? And the answer to that is actually what we are working towards. Because obviously we want as much resources as we can. But if we tell you to buy a separate laptop just to run our node, that is not the best experience now, is it? Mm. So with phase 3A, we'll have more detailed answers towards that. And with 3B, we will actually do practical implementations to see can you run a node while having your normal laptop work beside it. So that is something that I'm working towards. Now, my machine uh, has good RAM. It can run the node and it can also do computation and run VS code and stuff like that beside it. But not everybody has like an 18 GB RAM machine or a 32 GB RAM machine, right? So we are now, we started at a point and now we are going smaller and smaller in RAM capacity just to see where the breaking point is and then how do we go beyond hmm. I see, yeah. So how many phases are there? You said right now you're on phase three. How many phases are there? Absolutely. So there are actually five phases. And uh, we have a, like a detailed roadmap on the Fleek Network website as well. So if anybody is interested, the Fleek.network website, they just go to that and they will be able to see the entire detailed roadmap, the ways we want to help community and make the node runners benefic benefit the most from this. And um, by summer this year, the mainnet will be out. So majority of the hard work has been done. Now it's more about analyzing data, making tweaks, and get ready for mainnet launch in summer. So yeah, that's the plan. Nice, that's very uh, exciting. So actually, now now I'm quite curious about the 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 people behind Flick, right? Can you how how many share how many people are in your company, Flick? So we've got um we've got a very nice team so far. We've got about about thirty people, maybe twenty five to thirty people. It's it has been always um so we are expanding now so you know if anybody is looking for a role we may have an opening for you we've largely been a very engineering dependent and a tech dependent team because I believe that is how most Web three protocols should be invest very heavily on engineers and developers to build what you want and then start scaling it up so you know we've got a couple of good engineers we've got very good content marketing people we've got um, you know people leading the growth uh, from like the front and actually building strategies to bring this forward. Because you may have realized by now that we are still in very nascent stages of putting Fleek out to the world. The platform is in alpha, the network's testnet is being put out. 
So we have a lot of scope for development and growth still. We are very far from the finish line right now. And we want to be able to, um, you know, have a very nice balanced team that has tech and non-tech departments working together. So, you know, that's sort of where I fit in because I do tech and non-tech both. I become a bridge. Uh, you know, yeah. I become the feedback loop for the product team. I become like a marketing or like a distribution channel for the marketing team and stuff like that. And um, that's basically all my focus has been so far. So we are, we are not like a 200 member team. Not sure when we become that. But so far, we've got people who genuinely love what they are building and working towards. And I think that's what matters the most. So, yeah, um, that's my answer to that question. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, can you tell people who, who may not be so familiar with the developer relation, like what you do on a maybe daily basis? You know, and also what, yeah. what, what percentage of your time is spent doing what? You know, if you have some of that data. Absolutely. So, yeah, I've yeah. been a developer relations engineer for um, about three years now. Most of my career has been around communities. So I started off as a full stack developer, but I was always in touch with some club, some technical society, something somewhere, working on the back end for them, uh, making a website or making an app or being on the front end speaking and doing events, stuff like that. So developer relations engineering is a part of, well, a company in which you have somebody who can code as well, who can do workshops, technical talks, who can talk to the community, who can solve any questions that developers are having and essentially work to uplift the developer community, building on top of that protocol or that company. For example, in my case, it is my job to make sure that developers are building websites in general. And if they can understand how Next.js works, React.js works, I'm not even, I've not even gotten to Fleek yet, you see? So I work on a very fundamental level as well with developers where in, you want to learn anything, Cool. If I know it, I'll teach you. If I don't know it, I will learn to a point and then teach you. That is sort of what my focus is. And then if they're interested in bring sort of collaboration, I bring them to Fleek. And we deploy and we build startups and we support them. And that's a different realm. So yeah, developer relations basically focuses on coding, building relations with the community, doing events, and writing a lot of, lot of, lot of code. So I usually when I usually when I wake up, I have couple hours free to myself because I have I never schedule meetings when I wake up. I wake up, I revise any coding concept. So for example, I've been working a lot on Rust lately. I think Rust is going to be the peak or the most famous language in Web3 in 2024. So I want to gear up. I wake up, I do a little bit of Rust and uh, then I finish up any pieces of website or apps that I was working on. Then I start my community facing work where we do events, where we do community meetings or even ambassador calls. So stuff like that. So it's more of a 50-50 split, but it will vary. For example, ETH India, right? It was hectic and it was 60% yeah. communities and then 40% coding whenever you find time. ETH Tokyo, where we met, it was 80% communities because I was doing my own hacker house and, you know, like 20% coding, which is why coding started in the last 10 hours for me. So yeah. that's uh, sort of the split variable. Um, but yeah, it's definitely fun because you get to explore a lot of things. Nice. So mm, that's fascinating. So I guess you also make videos and write a lot. And actually, I think you raised an important point about Rust. Actually, I also want to ask about how do you learn new things on yourself? Like, do you what what are your go to resources? Like, how do you learn new things? Because I know, like, in the in the developer world, right, you always have to constantly learn new things. Yeah. Exactly. I think this is a very less spoken topic in the developer community. Is that how do you quickly grasp concepts and move forward? So for me, it is always, okay, what do I want to build? So say I'm like a web two full stack developer. I know Mern stack. I know basics of Java and stuff like that. And I want to work in solidity. So my first question is, okay, what do I build? The answer is very straightforward, a smart contract. Basically a piece of code that can do something with data on the blockchain. Okay, cool. How do I get started? Um, uh, for me, it is always easier to find a good video on YouTube that has a lot of views, a lot of general things covered in that video. I build my basics. I spend some time around that video. And from there, then I go to the documentation. So I first watch a video on Solidity, what is Solidity, etc. Then I go to the documentation just to see what have I missed out on, what is new in Solidity, and how do I get started. In Web3, we have some companies that have very good documentation. For example, Third Web, right? They have documentation mm. almost everything in the world. And on the other hand, we also have some companies 
who are not so good right they haven't really set up that documentation layer yet so it is very difficult to learn and build there and uh, so yeah my approach is very simple start off with something basic build it end to end refer to the documentation wherever you need to and uh, ship it as soon as possible and get feedback one thing i love about twitter is that put something out very quickly and people will share whether you made some mistakes whether you did something right or wrong and i am very open like roast my front end just go tell me the worst thing that i've written tweet about it it will anyway get me traction but i will learn something and that is more important so that's sort of my process of learning something new nice i like that process yeah thank thank you for sharing and i think that uh by sharing your work on twitter right i mean it's also like one i feel like it gives you more accountability right and then but also second like you said you also get the feedback from people and then you can learn from people and actually um, yeah exactly. i think the web3 community i would say that majority of people exist on like twitter and discord right as a, including the developer also so exactly yeah i've, I've also seen i've also follow like many um, developers also account on there just to see you know maybe see their journey right maybe they also learn exactly. something new from them that also it's just really not, that's really interesting going back to rasso but i'm like now now i'm curious maybe this is a, maybe a technical question but i'm sure you can you probably have the answer like why why do you think rasso would be the like the core language for web3 the important language yeah i have some intuition about, around it that so you know rust is blazing fast it has yeah. some inbuilt features that um, javascript or rather any dynamically typed language does not have so i feel that um, with the speed that it provides it becomes a very good resource to build your blockchains on and when i came to fleek a very good thing was that i was very heavily interested in rust and their entire network stack is built in rust and i was hmm. like wow i get to learn so much from people who are actually building the exact same thing that i want to build when i learn rust so it became very complimentary for me to actually then get motivated and learn rust secondly you can build smart contracts in rust deployed on solana you can build infra layer protocols in rust deployed on wherever whichever chain you like because almost all of them today support rust even if you don't want to be in blockchains if you even if you don't want to be in web3 you can make web2 servers using rust and they have amazing response time compared to what your node servers can do or your you know express servers can do share an example previously uh, i used to work as a software engineer and i be i made a full stack app for a company so just one weekend i was sitting i had, didn't have much to do i was like okay let's let me make the same thing that i made in express but this time i will use rust for it and not javascript my response time for a basic crud based api create read update delete api was 300 millisecond using javascript but with rust it was 3 millisecond so wow, you can see for me it was a, exactly i was yeah. blown away i went back to the founder i talked to them hey uh, can we switch the entire package they were like interesting we don't have time for that but um, it was absolutely phenomenal for me to see the impact that rust has and that was more than enough motivation for me to at least get started i'm sure i will never finish my journey in rust it's a forever you know continuous loop of learning 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 yeah but at least i'll get started and build something interesting that is sort of my idea i see yeah i'm sure it's similar to any other language right you always have like maybe continuously updating with newer newer version right fixing bugs and always releasing maybe new features exactly. right yeah so you yeah. just have to keep continuous learning you mentioned you want to build something what 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 type of uh, things do you want to build share with us first i want to build like basic implementations of various consensus mechanisms i believe hmm. that for every blockchain the base is always a consensus right how do nodes talk to each other and how do they come to a shared state of data together consensus mechanisms rule that entirely so we read a lot about hey proof of work proof of stake you know delegated proof of work, delegated proof of stake whatever um with with like upcoming chains even at fleek network we've got narwhal and bull shark working as the consensus layer we don't have proof of work or proof of stake i would love to explore these consensus mechanisms and building my own code to do that not read somebody and then see oh wow now i understand i want to build it myself i feel that as an engineer i will learn a lot through that process and you can do that in any language rust is not like a rust is just my um, liking so i will do it in rust but if you are somebody watching this podcast and you want to build it in javascript go ahead 
is just my preference and i want to do rust and of course you know uh, rust developers in the world are like these men only these men yeah so when it's in the future they will moment, be, yeah. exactly so you know supply demand i would always be in demand if i have rust in my skill set i can always build scalable applications mm-hmm. and you know i become the part of this small subset of developers interested in rust that's sort of my idea but yeah i mean my ideology will change i know something new will happen maybe a new language i might pivot but rust for now yeah nice yeah yeah it seems to me that so many different um, blockchain now um, even layer one blockchain use rust as one of the main programming language so i think it kind of makes yeah. sense Yeah, I'm actually curious. I mean, and feel free to answer to the extent of your knowledge. What would be involved in building a consensus mechanism? Like, what do you have to oh. write contract? Do you have to? So, it deals a lot around decent, not decentralized, but distributed computing at that point. Hmm. So, with Rust, what you would have to build is a pooling, um, pooling structure in which whatever. So, for example, you have connection to a blockchain node. I have a connection to a blockchain node. we both are separate we are connected to different nodes but you are putting some data on your node i am putting some data to my node but who will make sure that these the, the data that we have pushed is sequentially arranged obviously time stamp is allocated there but what if we push the same data at the exact same time stamp to the millisecond what happens then so there needs to be a pooling mechanism in which you can put in all the data and then arrange it properly there needs to be a distribution mechanism that can take all that arranged data and put it across all the nodes and then there needs to be an acceptance mechanism so that all the nodes can see that data and accept it as their own state so i would say that these three are like some preliminary things that i have learned while i was exploring consensus mm. uh, layer building again very high level view but with every consensus the method changes some might not even need pooling some might not even need acceptance so that is what i'm interested in you know like who needs what how do i build something out there and um, you know just make scalable structures i'm very passionate about websites that can serve 100000 users or probably more and uh, that sort of is my mindset so yeah that's i, I think that that would be a good answer yeah certainly yeah also looking forward to the day when you know blockchain can have the maybe the scalability right? i think that's all like one of the the dilemma that a lot of people talk about exactly. in, in blockchain that a lot of blockchains still face that problem especially like ethereum and bitcoin Because these are like the OG in blockchain, and they, exactly. I think, security-wise, it's great, right? Decentralization is great, but scalability is not really there. And that's why we see a lot of L2 zk rollup solution. Exactly. Yeah. I think yeah. Um, scalability is definitely a very big concern for the entire industry, and um, I'm pretty sure after scalability, it's going to be security. Because hey, we can serve 100,000 users, but how do we make it the most secure batch of 100,000 users? So yeah, I mean, Trellema, as you said, we will go in circle. Uh, yeah. yeah. So at at the beginning, you mentioned you want to build a developer community, right? In the future, uh, do you have yeah. some sort of an idea how how you would go about doing that? Because I think in in Web three, one of the very interesting skill set that um, a lot of Web three companies now require. It's called community building. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to yeah. thumbs up. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah, community building is actually super important in Web three. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what, what's your take on that? Yeah, how to build a developer Absolutely. community. So I feel that. So I've done this a couple of times before, in which I've gone from zero to hundred in building a community from scratch, and just getting the name of the company out as somebody or as some company that supports developers and does it as their core value. So. The first thing here is to actually have a roadmap. You know, how do you want? So, for example, I come to the Fleet community today. How should my journey look like? Is what I need to define as a developer relations engineer, as a community leader. I should know that. Okay, so today Lam is a part of the Fleet community. Great. Um, uh, is Lam a developer? Yes. Okay. What kind of technologies can he work with? Great. Ah, uh, what kind of Fleet technologies can he work with? Great. And what kind of incentives can I provide you at every level? to make sure that you like what you are doing because at the end of the day just saying good job might not be the best thing there needs to be some incentivization to keep you coming back it could be providing more educational material it could be actual monetary incentivization it could be swags there are a hundred ways to do this but it is always a road map that we need to define so that is the first thing for me so when we whenever i start building a community from scratch it is the road map then i find friends who are you know working towards the same goal as i am so if today 
um, I want to build a community of web developers. I would find friends who are good web developers and try to see what kind of value my community or I can provide to them. So value provision, incentivization, and having a clear roadmap are the three pillars on which your community will stand. And once you have these three things sorted, how do you provide value? How do you provide incentives? And what is the roadmap? You're good to go. Your community will, you know, then it's a cycle. New people will come in, older people will help them. New people will come in, older people will help them. It will just go in a circle. That's sort of how I envision it. Nice. Hmm. Fascinating. That's how I uh, heard of that. Yeah. So I would love to ask you though, um, what has yeah. been your experience with the communities you've been a part of? And what are some good or goods or bads you can share? Hmm. That's an excellent question. So for my community, community. Um, so, okay, let me share one of my experience when I was a, a learning about data science. Yeah, so actually, when I was learning data science, right, I was basically switching myself from a uh, pure business person background to a uh, developer or like technical background, right? I go, I went online, I found some courses, and then I found MIT X, right? They're offering a curriculum. I think it's called like a micro master in data science. And I enrolled in the program. I thought it was, I mean, everything was online, obviously, because I was living in Japan and the program was yeah. in US, the US time zone. And I, I thought it was just going to be like watching videos and doing lesson. I mean, of course, I was watching video doing lesson, right? But there's also a part of these where you get to interact with your classmates. And I think that was a part that was very interesting and exciting for me because actually thanks for that, I was able to progress faster. I was able to ask questions for the from the mentors, right? I was able to receive help. I was able, I, I also gave back by providing my knowledge, right? Actually, so I think I took four or five courses at that time. And the first two courses, I think I was uh, taking through it. And then I think the, the third course, one of the, yeah, the third course I was taking, I actually became, I think they call it like a community mentor, or community tutor, or something like that. Wow. So basically I was giving back the value. Actually, so I was taking the course at the same time. But then at the same time, as other students, right? But I was also responsible for, basically, this is like a voluntary effort, but I was just decided to like, okay, well, I want to try it. So, and it made me more, I have to hold myself accountable because whenever the materials release out, right, on the week, I, I, I forgot whether it was Monday or like whatever day it was, but the first day material come out, I have to learn it ahead of time. I have to do the exercise, right? So that I would know, so that I would know the material so that I can actually teach and then answer the question from the, people but of course you don't want to give away the answer right you want to yeah. just give some hints you want to provide some sort of a help or assistance to people it's just enough so that they would be motivated enough to like maybe point them in the right resources right direction yeah. so then they can find the answer for themselves instead of that and then yeah that was a very fun experience for me and i think I, the, the fun part for me is just um even just getting the recognition, right? Getting the thanks and the recognition from classmates, right? I mean, most of them, I've never even seen their faces, but we had like a Discord also. I think someone also set up a Discord. And to be honest, that was actually my first introduction to Discord. I had never wow. even used Discord before in my life. And then I, um, yeah, so I joined the Discord and just, you know, asking questions, talking to people. Uh, by the way, Discord was not really affiliated with the MITx, but that was just like how you know, like community was formed, right? So some people just yeah. took that initiative and built the Discord and formed the community. MITx, they had like a forum. Yeah, so forum. It's like very Web2, uh, typical like Blackboard type yeah. of forum. There's nothing special. But I think Discord is more, yeah, it's just more interactive in a way, I feel like. Yeah. I think that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that experience because I feel that it is such a good example of a good community, right? Mm -hmm. And how you were promoted. So your roadmap was set there you were giving back to the community. It, it's just a very good example. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm also learning that. I think that, again, the community building is one of the skill set for in the Web3 space that I would, would like to learn in the future. Like how to, you know how they all say that in technology, you go from well, zero to one, you probably might have heard of that book, right? But then yeah. for community building, you have to go from like, I don't know, one to 100 and then one to a, a, a thousand, right? And then one to 10,000 because, yeah, that's kind of the skill. So it's very yeah. fun. I fun think this learn. podcast is a big part of community building itself, right? So yeah, I think this is anyway a very phenomenal job that you're doing. Oh, so thank you. I, I think you're like 95 to 99% there.
if not a hundred, if not a hundred. So yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for the kind words. Going back to the Web three now, where do you think Web three is heading in the future? Absolutely, I think the cool thing about Web three is that every three to four months we see a new trend coming. So last year we went from blockchain and AI to um, zk. to then just roll ups in general not zk but yeah optimistic roll ups also had their space and then towards the end of the year we went back to infra protocols and infra layers becoming the hype right now the hype is deep in decentralized physical infrastructure so the cool thing about web3 is that with every hype it brings new technologies that people can explore and work on so i feel that web3 is heading in a direction where it is becoming fit for mass adoption and you know like we discussed scalability is a problem you cannot serve 100000 users on a blockchain right now but with roll ups coming in with security becoming better with infra protocols improving day by day providing lesser and lesser latency we are heading to a place where we are going to get more users for sure and on the flip side of this we've got things like account abstraction which is becoming better every day so you know i would give a small shout out to say um, what by economy is building what pemlico is building or what alchemy has put out for the world and these have just made the user onboarding experience so much better than you know what it used to be because imagine you have to go to a website connect metamask forget whatever emails you ever use metamask is yeah. the thing but that's restrictive now with you know what we use for example uh, at fleek we use dynamic for now and dynamic is an amazing solution because you can use your emails to connect So even if you lose access to MetaMask or something happens to the blockchain side of your identity, you still have like a backup with the account abstraction that you have. So yeah, so I would say a better user experience and more security and scalability is where we are headed. And within three months, again, we'll see the new trend. Maybe it'll be you know back to another consensus mechanism or something else. But yeah, it's very fun to keep an eye on Twitter. For Interesting. Yeah. Um... Thank you for sharing the perspective, and I I agree that yeah, the user experience definitely need to be improved upon. I think I would say that all of the guests on my podcast have have commented that yeah, user experience is one of the the thing that Web three need to improve upon. Um, now, just curious about your well, we we since we are still early in twenty twenty, what do you think would be some of the hype or the trend for this year in Web three? Well, um, hype and trend. Let's see. So we we can already see a lot of. infra level investments happening so so i was tracking very closely what's happening at eth denver and i was mm. able to see that uh, defi is going to become very very big once again because the bull market is also coming that means yeah. more token launches that means more exchanges dexes centralized exchanges whatever the next segment that i'm very bullish on is deepin decentralized physical infra i'm mm. building that myself at fleek and i can already see that it's having its own impact where people are now starting to accept fleek as a solution and moving sort of away from versal because they were able to see the benefits of perpetual storage and our customers also came back with feedback that hey we had these issues with these centralized providers but with you we are more happy and you are you know better for us in a way so yeah i would say defi and deepin are two very big areas security is the next one i think security is an all round year thing it never goes away it it just silent silently lives there audits are happening on c4 and mm. from those audits you can tell okay uh, which company has recently put in a lot of efforts to building a good security layer zk sync era is a company that recently spent more than 500000 dollars on an audit and imagine the amount of response they have gotten on that and that just made the protocol better so yeah three things uh, just to sum it up very quickly defi dpn security that's what i would say yeah certainly yeah dpn is one sector that i think yeah i hopefully we'll see more and more in the future if i remember correctly i think helium right helium is one of the yeah. like, original yeah. protocol that began with the whole dpin i think they were trying yeah. to what is it like give you a is it the broadband right broadband Got internet it. or something Got or internet exactly. internet through yeah the hotspot decentralized yeah yeah decentralized hotspot yeah so very interesting what what they doing Absolutely. So hopefully I we'll think, see more. Um, IPFS grants have helped a lot of people build amazing things there. I remember a lot of companies coming out of the IPFS accelerators and IPFS grants program and everything, where um, you know IPFS gave nodes, but now what do we do with these nodes? So people who started giving internet, I saw a company started giving uh, VPNs, decentralized VPNs, and a couple of cool things happening there as well. 
So yeah, really? definitely. How 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 does decentralized VPN works? I have no idea. <laughs> I saw their white paper and I was like, okay, very cool. When do I see the mainnet? And now I'm just waiting for them to either release the mainnet or tell us how it will be developed. So hmm. yeah, I mean VPNs, and then even I mean, you see, if you have the infra layer ready, basically IoT can also exist with blockchain. So Internet of Things, but with blockchains. So hmm. again, that is a combination I'm yet to see work. But yeah, that's something that I'm sort of going to research myself whenever I find time. Um, and yeah, that that's what I would say. Interesting. Do you do you think that we will have more and more things from Web two that will become like a similar version in Web three, but except that it's decentralized? So I think what what I've seen a lot, even like in the past few years when I've been Web three, is that I feel like the word decentralized. There's a lot of things that have been decentralized, right? We have now we have well, uh, well, decentralized finance is one of the first one, right? I mean, and then we have decentralized social networks now, right, with Lens and Facaster. And then, well, deep pin, right? Was like I don't know, do you yeah. decentralized yeah, infrastructure, and then many other things. So, you um, any particular web two areas that you think that will become decentralized? Maybe like VPN. Yeah. Any, anything think, that you're exciting about? I think there's like a hundred answers to this because literally everything yeah. that can be exist that can exist centrally can exist decentrally. So mm. I would say that hosting is a very easy service to build. Yeah. And um, that that's that's already become decentralized. Then uh, computational servers. So what Amazon mm. EC2 can provide you today. Imagine without having to rely on one EC2 service, but having your entire server uh, distributed across the network. So it's not one computer that wo- that's working for you as a server. It's like a hundred blockchain nodes that's working for you as a server. That's one thing that I'm really really bullish on, and I, I've already seen it get built. So. Hundred percent, I think that's a service that can be built and will be ready very soon. But again, um, I will see. I'm I'm actually looking to read and do more research on things like um, you know experimentational stuff around Web three. So as I mentioned, IoT is a big one. Bluetooth is another one. So you know why is Bluetooth a connection between two hmm. computers? Can it be between the entire node seat? So you know that's one thing. And of course, we've talked about mobile hotspots by you know what Helium was trying to build or what Helium yeah. is still trying to build. So definitely, um, that's one thing that I'd love to see in the future, and I'm very bullish. Nice, yeah, same here. Anyway, exciting future is exciting, uh, which bring me to the show signature question. I want to hear your perspective on this. Is like, how can we as Web three native builders, right? How, what can we do to onboard one billion people user into Web three? Mm-hmm. There's the, I have a big answer to this because I have ranted a lot on Twitter about this. That the second a company comes and says we'd onboard the next billion users, I'm already like, no, no, you won't. <laughs> because I go through, and this is not a dig on any company. This is just a very personal opinion that mm-hmm. before claiming that we will solve problems for a hundred uh, or like a billion developers or billion users, first solve problems for the hundred people in your Discord server. At least talk to them, see why they are using or why they are not using your platform. Have good documentation, have good content. At least put your brand ethos out there to tell the world what you are trying to solve. Secondly, get better user experience. You cannot expect me to connect my MetaMask to every account when I have actual money living inside MetaMask. That is how wallets get sniped. That is how wallets get drained. So security is just not there. So therefore, better user experience, better documentation. And better awareness. Now, um, with communities, with more events, we've seen awareness happen. But awareness is also like a loop. You need to bring in more people every year to make them aware about Web3. And you need to give them proper tools to actually use Web3. I've seen so many events where I just go and ask them a basic question. Hey, how many of you heard about MetaMask? And Almost nobody raises their hand. So now I have to leave everything that I decided and teach them what MetaMask is. Imagine how far behind we are in a billion users when people don't even know MetaMask. So um, it starts off at a very small point where first awareness needs to be built, then education needs to be done, then comes user experience, better infrastructure, everything. And then we need to support people. So whoever uses your protocol, be in touch with them incentivize them do something to make them feel like it's they are a part of the network how are you building a decentralized network but not providing incentives to people in your decentralized network 
that is a big problem we need to solve to bring the next billion users or bring the first billion users we've not gotten to the first yet yeah. so bring the first billion users uh, but yeah what, what's your opinion on this i i think that's what i would say but what what do you feel yeah i i think i basically agree with basically everything you said uh and i think with the, i think we have to and then i just want to add one more thing so to i think what you've said is user experience right education awareness and security right so i yeah. i mean i completely agree with all of that and then i think the the last part that i want to add on which is uh, this is this opinion this is also opinion of mine but also from some other guests on my podcast also is that i think web3 has a reputation of problem in in the sense that uh, we have way too many scams and uh, hacks and bad news right in in our industry and i think it's not really helping to you know when people hear about like oh another bridge has got hacked and you know maybe 70 million dollars just got drained out of the thing when people hear numbers like that right they're like oh why why should i go into web3 yeah. so i think that's probably gonna hold a lot of people back so until we i i don't really have an answer for that obviously that's why i i, I, I like to ask my guests for their opinion but yeah i think the re- reputational problem i feel like it has to be the collective effort from everyone in the industry right so yeah, Absolutely. I think it's also come with the security. As security improve and user experience become better, and yeah, hopefully things that so we we'll have fewer hacks and maybe the amount will be less. Things will become more secure. Yeah, but I, yeah, I don't think we can. Be. Yeah, I don't think we can expect people to be fully educated though about like how to use something in Web three for now, for the time being, because it's still very difficult, right? Like a lot of the process, even like. Right just using metamask to buy something how to on ramp certain thing where to buy certain token how to make sure that it's not a a scam token before you buy it if you go on decentralized exchange right and then even if you put on centralized exchange actually uh so my 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 last episode with one of my guests uh, i'm gonna leave a link up here actually he talked about you know some of the problem with centralized exchange one of it was like what if the central exchange go bankrupt and then they they you know hold custody of your money then you well you lose your money right it's also yeah so you cannot definitely. really be 100 percent safe right, everywhere but, so hopefully definitely yeah so i i, I don't really have the, the answer for that but hmm. anyway but what is your favorite um uh, tools that you go to on a daily basis, right? For for your work and maybe in Web3 also. What are some of your tools that you use? A for lot? me, it sort of varies a lot. So I'm a big wallet enthusiast. I want to try out different wallets, see what they are doing, how are they bringing better experience for me, et cetera, et cetera. One shout out I'd love to give here is Rabi Wallet because they have a good layer of security where before every transaction I need to like do a two-factor kind of a thing to actually make that transaction go forward. So to an extent, it prevents wallet sniping, wallet hacking, stuff like that. Whenever I build products, I love hard hat because for local mm. Ethereum development, hard hat brings me the ease of using JavaScript with Solidity. So yeah, that's one tool that I really love and support and use. Experimentations around dApps, MetaMask, obviously. Uh, not going to waste my time setting up Rabi for development purposes, MetaMask. Just go through it. The third web is one tool that I've used tremendously whenever I've built anything around NFTs because they provide a very good layer where you can mint your NFT, put it on IPFS, get the hash, get everything you need, and then make a marketplace sort of a framework out of it. So um, I've built educational websites as well, where once you finish a course, you get an NFT, and that entire NFT infra was built using third web. So definitely a big shout out and a big helper tool as well. Um, whenever I'm trying to build something, I find myself that whenever I Google, I find third web in the content that is about that. So definitely helpful. I, I use a couple of other tools like Notion or whatever management tools to make sure that all my documentation is in one place. And um, that's majorly it. All communications on Discord, communities on uh, sort of Twitter and Discord and management on Notion, stuff like that. And for all kinds of dev purposes, you know, again, VS Code. Nothing beats VS Code. I'm a big fan. Yeah. So that's that's sort of the tools I use. What about you? Yeah. What about you? Yeah, for sure. GitHub and GitHub Copilot too. Just add in there. <laughs> yeah, GitHub Copilot for VS Code. I think it helped me a lot. But you don't want to be fully... Right? And I think now we live in the age of AI, so uh, yeah. open AI, chat GPT for sure. 
I feel like whoever is not using AI at this point is probably going to be lagging behind. Like I, we, I think yeah. we're in the age of if we, I mean, you either have to either use AI that we currently have, or if you don't use it, you will be lagging behind, right? It's like basically, I feel like we'll yeah. amplify your productivity and amplify your thinking power also. So if you just don't use it, I, and I don't see any reason why people should not use it. I mean, they even have like a free version, right? You don't even need to pay for it. Just use exactly, a free yeah. version for now and you can get enough of the value out of there already. So yeah. those are, yeah, my, I would say my favorite. Yeah, is how tool. we met. We, yeah, we were exactly. discussing AI. Yeah, yeah, the project we were building on AI, yeah. But of course, there's, there's some like drawbacks to AI, uh, the, the, the large language model as we know it as well. Yeah. It's not, I don't know if the, you know, the AI community is going to be able to solve some of the inherent problem in that or not, but I'm excited where the definitely AI yeah. is heading. And also for the decentralized AI as well too. That's another part that's also very exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm also Fantastic. following that space quite closely for this year to see where it's helping. What's happening in that space? Yeah. Would you walk me up to speed? Anything that you saw or, you know, burnt um, or anything? No, to be honest, like, so I I haven't seen any, I actually, that's one thing I would love to see. If you know any guests who's working in AI or researcher, whether Web2 or Web3, I would love to actually bring them onto my podcast also. Absolutely, um, yeah. I've only read some documents, seen some website from a few protocols around AI. I have not actually seen the actual demonstration. And for me, I'm, I'm you know, when I, I work in text, so I'm a big believer in, you know, seeing seeing the code, seeing the how it actually works under the hood, things like that, right? Because whatever you put on the site, right, it could say one thing, but like it might, if it's not the right thing in reality, then it's, yeah, it's not up to, it's not ready for adoption yet. Uh, one of the things that I'm feel like I've been reading a lot about is like just decentralized AI in the sense that how can you decentralize some components of the machine learning process right so there's usually a couple of different process right you have the the data process where you have to do data cleaning the data inference and then the model the in the inference part i think that's one of the part where they're probably trying to decentralize to be honest i don't mm. have a full grasp of how they plan to decentralize that because up until now all the ai models that i have built have always been centralized in the sense that um, yeah like i need to have the data in whether in my laptop or on some drive on the cloud somewhere right that I can access to, and then I need enough like computing power. You need a lot of computing power, a lot of computing, right? Yeah. yeah, whether it's CPU or GPU, but most likely GPU. If you're training with neural network, you need GPU for sure. A period. Yeah. So you need like you need that computing power centralized in a way, right? So I don't know how it would work on the decentralized AI, exactly. and then for the inference part also. Yeah, yeah. So that's also a big question mark for me. And there's a lot of hype, I would say, going on right now in web three about the decentralized AI, but I'm, I guess I'm somewhat a little bit on still on the skeptical side. I'm a believer, but I'm still on the skeptical side until I can see some actual product or some demos that are actually working or maybe, or yeah. maybe I have to read some more research paper in like very uh, convoluted mathematics, like PhD level, which I don't think I can fathom. It will take me a few years of going back to school, maybe <laughs> to understand a lot of those like very extremely uh, convoluted mathematics, but yeah, but like I said, I, I remain hopeful though in in the in how Absolutely. it will come out in the future. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, just two more questions here from my side. One is that uh, more senior, like a very excellent engineer, would like to ask, like, do you have any advice for developers or maybe people in general who want to break into Web three? Hundred percent. I think that for developers who have been interested in Web three for a long time, or they just want to get into Web three now, mm -hmm. I think. The most fundamental thing I can tell you is please have your Web2 basics sorted. If your Web2 basics are not done yet, it is going to be very, very difficult for you to scale up and to actually understand and build on top of your knowledge. Every Web3 platform will use fundamentals from Web2. It would need you to have grasp of ReactJS. It would need you to have grasp of how a server will work or what distributed computing is or what dev DevOps is. So if that knowledge mm. is just not available to you and you have not spent time learning all of that, you cannot become a good Web3 engineer. Because at the end of the day, we are building solutions and we're building softwares on top of blockchains. So how to build a software is something you need to know before getting and putting that software on a blockchain. 
because then your deployment layers will change. You need to do some other type of architectures or not. You can only decide that if you know Web2. So make a basic React app, make a basic server, connect the two, get the data flowing, understand how databases work in general. I, I feel that, you know, relational, non-relational, that is up to you. SQL, MongoDB, they both perform very nicely. Just build that information for you first. Once that is done, then move on to Web3 because at least you have a very good foundation to work with and you will go very quickly from point A to point B. If you're somebody who has just started writing HTML and now you say, okay, I'll make a DAP, it will take you six months. But if you make an app before a DAP, it will take you less than two months. And then your major focus is not how to make a website, it is how to write Solidity or how to connect Solidity to React, stuff like that. So first advice, build Web2 foundations, very, very important. Second advice, never, never refrain from learning because Web3 changes a lot. If you say, okay, now I know how to write Solidity, I will not learn anything again. You will be outdated in three months. The job market will just move so much ahead of you, you will not be able to catch up. So always be on the lookout for good articles and things you can read. And whatever you learn, share them online. Tell the world that, hey, I learned something. It will get you hiring managers, founders, good communities, good engineers around you. It is just the most beneficial to share things with the people around you and build a community around them. That's what I would say is my piece of advice for any developer who's interested on listening. Excellent advice, actually. I think that might totally make sense, yeah. Because uh, in the, I think at the end of the day, a lot of the the, the dApps that we use in Web3, we, we still have to use some Web2 technology, right? Obviously, like for the front end, for example. Exactly. Maybe some some Web3 product also still use like a centralized database, you know? Yeah, so there's still a lot of Web2 components being used, eh? right? Yeah, so you exactly. cannot really escape away from that. Yeah. I mean, just to add on, you know, see React mm. or Node.js or all, they are not centralized, they are not decentralized. They are mm. just a tool, right? Yeah. You can use it in whatever way you like. So learn the tooling first, then move to the ideology that you want to follow. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Just wanted to. Yeah, yeah, totally. Make, makes sense. And then I think, I feel like with programming language and the tools, once you have learned and master, and by master, I mean like have a really good command and grasp of the language of one or two languages and learning a new language would become so much easier, right? Yeah, I think exactly. it's similar to human language in a way. After you've learned your second language, right, you know the grammar of that language and you can learn the third and fourth language because now you understand like how human language works versus someone who is monolingual, right? I'm, I'm sure you were well aware of that. Too. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Awesome. And yeah, final question. Uh, where can people follow you? Please feel free to share any social media handles and username, website. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, I'll, one of the best ways to reach out to me, I'm always active on, is called Twitter. I think my Twitter is somewhere here. This is me, Kanish Khurana. Uh, Kanish Khurana underscore on all sorts of platforms. This is sort of my like stable handle everywhere. Okay. So you can definitely find me on Twitter. That's the best way to reach out. And, uh, you know, if you're on LinkedIn, just type Kanish Khurana. You'll see somebody wearing a red top and whatever, T-shirt or whatever. And uh, yeah, that's basically me. So Twitter and LinkedIn are the best places to find me. Awesome. Yeah, I'll make sure to put your... Um social account information in the show notes so that people can follow you and maybe put your website out there also too so you can check out your website maybe sign up for the alpha right alpha test net right now that, yeah yeah, yeah. Alpha, awesome well once again uh hanish it's been awesome talking to you today it's been a lot of fun uh thank you for being on the show i Good mean pleasure. it was a phenomenal experience for me i had so much fun talking to you and uh i just hope to you know be in touch Meet you very, very soon in some, you know, ETH events or conferences and keep this going. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, thank, thank you again for having me. I'm sure we see each other in this small Web3 world, yeah? Absolutely. Cheers. Have a good one. And we are back to my studio. What do you guys think about this episode with Kanish Kurana? Um, every time I met Kanish, I'm always amazed by his enthusiasm and the passion he has for coding and Web3. For the next episode, we'll be talking to Abhijat Shinha, who is the CEO and founder of Decimo, and they are building a decentralized, trustless data marketplace. It's an interesting episode about Web3 that you don't want to miss. If you enjoyed this episode, please give a like and subscribe because it would mean a lot to me. Uh, thank you for listening and see you next time.